the cloud. Welcome everybody. This is the second fireside chat on shared concerns in open research. Uh, we have wonderful speakers today, but in favor of time, I'm not going to introduce everybody. I just want to share that we have an etherpad for the call today. Please um, use it as you would like. Introduce yourself. Tell us what brings you here, what communities you're joining from, any announcement you want to make. Uh, this, this pad is yours to take at the end of the call. Um, with that, we also have a code of conduct. Uh, the point of contact would be Kirsty and me, who are the co-lead of the Turing Way. And you could also uh, contact Amy as the chair of the session. Just a quick introduction to the Turing Way. It's a community-led community guide on data science. And our aim is to make sure that we're making open, reproducible, ethical, and collaborative research accessible for wider community. And a part of that is to make sure that we are talking to each other, making places for, for cross-community collaboration. And Fireside Chat is that place for us to make that happen. So today's conversation is very, very uh, dear to my heart because I really care about exchanging resources in open research and bringing people together to talk about things we care about. But we also hope that the conversation today will stem a lot of discussions in the future. Um, please keep that in mind that we would like you to host Farsight Chat in the future. So if you feel that this space is exactly what you needed, please contact me or Kirsty. Um, all these information would be available in the Etherpad. And with that, I'm really, really delighted to welcome Amy Sang, who's the chair of today's session. Amy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Malvika, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. Very excited to have you here. It's sort of an evening for me over here in Utrecht, Amsterdam. Oh, sorry, Utrecht, Amsterdam. Utrecht, the Netherlands, where I'm based at the moment. I'm just going to uh, start with introducing myself, and then I'll go around and ask the other panelists to do so as well. Um, I, I, my name is Emmy Tang. Um, I am currently, well, my day job is uh, as the Community Engagement Manager for the uh, open Science Program at the Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands. Um, but I also serve as a uh, co-organizer for the Open Life Science Program. I'll tell you all about that later in the informal time, probably. It's a very exciting project um, on um, em empowering and supporting ambassadors in open science all around the world. Um, previously to this, how I got to this point, um, I was, I had a PhD in neuroscience um, and that got me exposed to a lot of uh, issues in the way that research is done and the research culture, which I'm sure again, we'll be able to dive into that with our, all our lovely panelists today um, as well. Um, but yeah, that got me interested to try and do something about this to change research for the better, I suppose. So that um, brought me here with that. I'm gonna ask maybe we could start with Umberto, if you don't mind introducing yourself a little bit and how you got to where you are. Thank you, Amy. It's very nice to see you again and to talk to, to, talk to all of you. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Umberto Rat. I'm from uh, Cordoba, Argentina. I'm, I was born here, raised here, and I also work here right now. Uh, so I'm a research scientist at the National Institute of Agricultural Technology. I have worked mostly with uh, the diseases of crops uh, for the past two years. I have been working with the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. Um, and how I got here? Well, I, I, I studied biology. I eventually started doing some research in, 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 in molecular biology eventually got a position right here and as a side project i i'm very concerned about the the accessibility of knowledge i'm i am i try to promote knowledge as a human right and I, i've been working in a few initiatives uh, one of them is called panlinguen which i will uh, mention afterward and, and besides that i'm also a member of the advisory committee on open science of the Ministry of Science of Argentina. Uh, so, uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Nice to meet you all. Thank you very much, Humberto. Um, can we have Kate next? 
Hi folks, I'm Kate Hertwick. Uh, I am located in Seattle, Washington, where it is a beautiful gray morning outside. I am excited to be here and grateful for the invitation um, to be able to speak and represent some of the communities with which I've been involved. Um, my graduate training was in plant evolutionary biology. Um, I branched out into bioinformatics and computational methods afterwards as a postdoc at the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center, where I also started to become involved in the carpentries. Um, I spent some time as an assistant professor in the University of Texas system um, before transitioning out of academia and into research facilitation, uh, first at a cancer research center and now at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, where I work as open science specialist, supporting the scientists who are funded by CZI in adopting and implementing open science methods. Um, I am pleased to still have some interactions with the Carpentries, as well as Meditocencia, a group in, based in Argentina that helps support um, general training methods for Spanish-speaking audiences. Um, I was involved in governance for the Carpentries for several years, and so I have a lot of appreciation um, for the uh, nuances of what it means to make decisions for a group. And I'm also, because of my position at CZI, interested um, in capacity building in general and helping other organizations, um, primarily within biomedical sciences, but also touching other areas uh, to be able to get them to work together. Um, so again, thanks to the organizers for inviting me and I'm very glad to be here. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, Diego? Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Amy. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for inviting me. It, it's it's so good to be here with all these people with all this experience. I I'm, I don't have that much experience with open knowledge. Uh, I, I don't have that much experience with anything at all. I, I'm the mid twenties. <laughs> I'm doing. My, I did my master's in bioinformatics at the University of São Paulo, and I'm currently doing a PhD uh, working with conceptual modeling of uh, biological concepts on Wikidata. So uh, my, my research involves a lot of thinking about how community develops concepts and organize itself. Um, uh, we have a, a, I organize a group here in Brazil called Código Bonito, where I gather people from all Brazil to talk about uh, codes in, uh, in, in the context of bioinformatics mainly, but also in data science in general. Um, I'm very involved with the Wikimedia Foundation in many aspects. Uh, in not, not in a in a position there, but as a contributor, as a community member, and I'm also part of the organization of a hackathon in Brazil, a, a recurrent event called No Budget Science Hack Week. It's a meta science event where we get together to think about how we can do science with no budget, and spe specifically meta science with no budget. Uh, I won't remember everything that that I'm involved in anyways. It, it, as we mentioned in the pre-chat, it, it's always a, a large number of communities that overlap in many ways. But yeah, that's it. I'm happy to be part of this meta community of open science and I, I'm anxious to talk to you more about that. Fantastic. Thanks, Tiago. And last but not least, Melissa. Hello, my name is Melissa. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm a white woman wearing a black and white animal print shirt, headphones, kind of faded green hair and glasses. Um, I am based in Brazil, uh, where I am originally from. So I live in Florianópolis, which is a city in the south of Brazil with a cool university and a lot of beaches. It's summer right now almost. And so it's a very nice sunny day outside. Um, so I feel like the odd one out here because I'm not exactly involved in open research. I do have a background in mathematics and I used to be a professor at the Federal University of Santa Catarina here in Florianópolis. But I just like Kate, I left hey. academia a couple of years ago oh. and transitioned uh, uh, into- like a webinar thing. Oops. <laughs> transitioned into a software engineering job at Quantsite, working with mainly NumPy, but also other scientific Python communities. Um, recently, we have been awarded a grant from CCI, where Kate works also to um, improve 
uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion around the scientific Python ecosystem. And so I've been doing a little bit of work around that. And I'm super happy to be here with this wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, and thank you for reminding us that we forgot to do our uh, visual description. So uh, for, um, you know, folks uh, for accessibility of this call, um, let's go back and do that. Um, I am a I, I'm Emmy. I am a um, early 30s Asian woman, um, and I'm wearing a gray sweatshirt against a white background. We go around again, uh, Umberto, if you don't mind uh, giving a little visual description of yourself. Okay, I'm uh, in my late 30s. I'm wearing a white shirt. Um, I'm mostly tan because it's also summer here and I've been outside a lot. Uh, so that's most of it. Thank you. Thanks, Umberto. Okay. Um, I am a Caucasian, a uh, femme appearing, a uh, gender queer, non binary person. I have really long brown hair. I'm wearing a blue shirt. I have glasses. And there is a lot of weird and interesting stuff in my background because. If I have to be in my home, then you all should have to appreciate being in my home too. Fantastic. And Tiago. Great. Uh, I'm Tiago. I'm in my mid 20s. I'm a white male. I have brownish, blondish hair, and I'm wearing a black shirt. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, all right. So we've heard from all our panelists and the amazing places that they come from and the amazing journeys that they took to get to where they are. Um, I, I gotta say, I, I'm, it makes me so, so, like, I feel so um, humble to be in this panel discussion because everyone has included in their, almost everyone has included in their introduction sort of like, uh, Tiago, you said, I know nothing about open knowledge. Absolutely. I don't think that's true at all. Um, and and uh, Melissa, you mentioned you feel like you're the odd one out. I, I, I hope, um, you know, these, these are things that I, I, we'd love to dive into later. But before we get to that, um, I, I, I want to start off with a question. Um, what does openness, openness means for all of us from all these different backgrounds and, and from all these different experiences and journeys? Um, let me know if you'd like to start. <laughs> See Kate waving. I'm happy to start on this. Um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about what openness means since my job is focused on supporting open science methods in particular. And uh, openness to me, you know, you can think about the science part of it, or you can think about open communities. And I think both of those tend to have different flavors and how we discuss it. Um, and what I see as uniting both of those is openness as a, sort of like an assessment of how accessible information is um, and how accessible participation and events are. Um, and so accessibility then, if we unpack that a little bit, it means that um, information or events are discoverable or findable, um, that people can actually attend or participate in whatever events are happening. Um, or be able to use whatever information they've been able to find. And so that I think I'll, I'll leave as sort of a very nebulous um, and general way of defining openness. And I'll leave it to some of the other panelists to talk more about what openness then means for communities or for science. Leaving the awkward silence and uh, folks, Tiago. <laughs> Just to break the science here. Yeah, it, that, that's actually an interesting question. And Kate put about there's an openness aspect of the communities. And I, I perhaps I will say that what I think about openness in the context of knowledge. And I, I, I'm concerned with open knowledge in a way that uh, I think that if we're producing knowledge, ideas about the world, it should be accessible to everyone, right? I mean, I think that's a, that's a, there's a basic human right of accessing knowledge. And doing open research, open data, it's trying to ensure that this right of equal access to knowledge is something that is, is not only in theory, but also in practice. And that, that has a technical aspect of 
uh, making sure research is free is, is accessible on the web, but it also has a political societal impact of making sure that people have access to, to computers and to internet and, and to language training and that all of that, I think it's inside the open community, both from the aspect of making it uh, available, but uh, it, it doesn't, it's not only about making things available, but making sure that people can reach the, these things, this content that, that is somehow available. I think it's, it's something in that direction. Umberto. Well, I, I, share, I share both Kate and Tiago's vision of open. I, 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 I would like to mention a, a, a narrow definition, which includes a, a science in it and an open science in it. And I would like to use a, a very recent one that was uh, accepted and published uh, a, a few days ago, um, uh, um, adopted by 193 countries uh, during the last UNESCO convention, uh, so, uh, which was a wonderful advancement in the, in the, in the sharing of, of values, guidelines, and standards of, of, of open science itself. And, and, and they used the word inclusive construct which combines like movements and, uh, uh, well, I, I had that doc document around, but it was something like movements and practices uh, uh, surrounding scientific knowledge to make it accessible, available, uh, reproducible, fair, uh, and equal. It, it has a lot of, of aspects of it, but I like it, the, 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 the word or the combination of words as inclusive construct because it, it it reflects a, a vision of, 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 of which is something that we have uh, to share and, and to support and to adopt and to discuss, uh, well, so many things, but again, a nebulous definition, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Melissa, go ahead. Yeah, so I can go last and say that, uh, Almost everything I wanted to say has been said, but at the same time, I feel like I, I, because I'm not directly involved in research, I tend to look at communities in a more, uh, in a particular way, let's say, and I would say that openness is an invitation to participate and support to be able to participate more than access. And like Tiago said, I think uh, access is great, but it's not enough. And so having giving people support and training and the ability to understand how they can get involved and how they can participate guarantees inclusion more than access, which is what I'm aiming for in terms of openness. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah, I the so if I just sort of briefly um, summarize what were mentioned, you know, we talked about being able, uh, availability of that knowledge, of the knowledge that we produce and that being a right. We talked about um, inclusivity. We talked about equal access to, to knowledge um, and to the outputs of research. And then Melissa, you framed it beautifully, which, which I thought was, was um, I, would like to, I would like to print that out and put that on my wall, <laughs> um, an invitation to participate as you see the, as the definition of openness. So I think that there's, def there's a lot of sort of um, similar uh, sort of alignment there, right? Like that, like that all these terms feel there's slightly different levels in terms of, you know, how much there is required from the people who we are inviting to participate or we're inviting to making things available and access to, uh, accessible to. Um, I, I sort of want to go on that and, and ask you all, in, in the communities that, that you are in, um, what's close? So why, you know, if, if, we're, if our aspiration is to make things available and invite people to join, what are the scenarios where we're not doing that right so what are, what are the um where are the what are the cases uh where where that's not not happening or not con not conductive to happening um tiago yeah that, that's a good question because I, I want to comment on melissa's comments about this difference between access and inclusion that i i come from the research angle so when we talk about open it's usually about open access i mean that's 
at least one of the base standards that you have open access to the knowledge products, but we we don't talk. It's that's different from the code community that an open project invites people to join and contribute code and contribute ideas. So I think in the, in the research community, uh, one thing that is closed is this inclusion process. I mean, it's 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 very rare for a research project to be open for participants from the community. So an, an academic laboratory that is open for someone to come and just join the project, uh, it's, it's, it's not common. And I think that's a closed aspect of, of at least at, at the, the share of biomedical sciences that I see, it's, we have to work a bit better on this inclusion aspect of, of openness, which is a bit closed for now. Yes. Yeah, so really going beyond, you know, just um, um, it, so th there's there's a few things that is very interesting there, Tiago. There's the, you know, that we publish research at the end of research, and hence nobody knows or are able to know what happens before, right? So that's that's the closeness of that process. But then there's also, I guess, I don't know if I'm going on a tangent here, so please feel free to go somewhere else. Um, <laughs> but um, but. Also, you know, if it's opening the door to the lab enough for people to say, hey, I want to join your project. Um, I want to wonder, wonder if others have, have more thoughts on that. I think I can talk a little bit about that because it's not a lab. But we are supposed to be what Tiago described as an open project where everyone is able to participate. And it's made of volunteer contributions. So theoretically, anyone can participate. But we do see that there's still a lot of barriers in terms of, uh, first, some people who will feel intimidated by uh, the you know, whole process of working in the open, working in public, uh, making mistakes in public, and having communications in the open. None of that is easy. And, I think those are big challenges that we have to learn and figure out how to overcome so that people can feel comfortable and safe participating in our communities. And on the other side, there is uh, training and information and uh, all of those aspects of like the learning curve so that people can get involved. And I think that is somehow similar to research in the sense that even if you do have access, you still need some training to be able to understand what's being done and what the research is getting into and the results and how to interpret that. And so there's a little bit of effort of support so that people can actually contribute in a meaningful way and understand what's happening. I'm going to go ahead and start to tie in some of the things that I saw folks put on the um, icebreaker list about some of the you know, areas of most concern or most interest. And um, it's because of this sense that I got, especially now that I work with a group of people who have open in the name we are really putting ourselves on the line, right? Saying like that we're making open happen and so it's really forced me to start thinking about um, what openness means and especially working in biomedicine. We've had a few allusions to this, like there are certainly cases in which we have to consider openness as balanced against the rights of individuals for data privacy, managing data security, and then other axillary issues associated um, um, with, with those types of concerns. And uh, you know, this is also me having a research background that's not in biomedicine, right? And so I came from a very privileged background in which it was easy for me, relatively speaking, to put all of my code, all of my data as it was being developed as publicly available. And I made myself be okay with that. The truth is that that is a privilege um, given sort of the intellectual culture that I grew up in and what I was trained in um, and where it is that I sort of sat career wise. And I've become much more sort of compassionate to the idea that openness is not like this pinnacle on a mountain that we're all going to climb to, um, that openness is a way of 
thinking about the work that we do. And as others have mentioned, it's like always going to be balanced against the diminishing returns of investing huge amounts of time in making things open, um, huge amounts of energy, and then dealing, especially if you're with a community, of handling um, feedback from the community who are pushing back against what you're doing. So this ties in um, with governance, which was mentioned many times um, in the icebreaker of folks who are interested in like, how do we make decisions as an organization? Um, I find it really interesting, Melissa, your mention of, you know, the idea that um, like an open project invites participation from everyone, but does that mean that what everyone wants and what everyone suggests actually get done? Like, does it mean that every pull request that gets submitted on GitHub is eventually merged? Um, and I think confronting this idea of like, what is participation? Um, what does it mean to accept someone's effort? Does it mean you have to accept the code or does it mean that you accept their input in the format of a pull request? Um, and again, all of that comes down to how do you make decisions? Um, and I think a lot of us, you know, come into open spaces with stars in our eyes saying that, you know, that we're going to reach that pinnacle on the mountain. But the truth is that in practice, we have to make decisions in a way that often falls short of some of these, um, you know, some of these like sort of uh, the, the epitome of our values. Yeah. Um I, yeah, <laughs> so so many points there, and I see that folks in the iceberg are also echoed a lot about. So the, especially, I think I think for me personally, I'm increasingly realizing that barrier that you mentioned just before, you know, the governance, um, which is the time and energy, right? So, um, I'm I'm very privileged that I can be here at you know six thirty my time in the evening currently, and I can totally imagine a lot of people who you know, have other uh, roles or other, uh, for example, roles as a carer, they may not be able to spend as much time with this type of time in these type of conversations. And so the virtue of that, by virtue of that, like every, all, all the things that we do, unless, you know, we have to be, there is all almost, I, I wonder if it's possible to, for that ideal right that something is open to everyone almost um this, this is a question very close to my heart um but but at the same time decision making so important that you know so many communities where this is not discussed this is not clearly laid out that a lot of people you know because of the unclarity around this how decisions are made um they become disengaged with the project because they find it difficult to understand how, whether their inputs are taken in or when it is or how it is. Um, and so, yeah, definitely super, uh, it's, a, it's a big barrier that I think uh, at least a lot of people don't recognize. Um, I don't want to, I'm virtual, please go ahead. <laughs> well, well, I, I was thinking while I was listening to Kate, it, it, it's something that I haven't questioned myself a lot, where, like uh, about the limits of openness or where, uh, how open things should be. And, and then again, I, I, I went around a definition of uh, as open as possible, which, which of course has to do a lot with, in different areas of knowledge about it, it could be intellectual property uh, uh, or it could be. Uh, indigenous knowledge, uh, which is rare. It could be uh, 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 information about endangered species. Uh, okay, for instance, she said she has background in, 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 plant, in, in plant science. So for example, location or, or data about endangered species is something that you would like to anonymize or tell the anonymize. So, so there is a lot of discussion of, of whether how, how far open it can be and where you, you, you should draw a line uh, about that. I, I, I'm sure there is a lot of people that have been uh, thinking about this aspect. I haven't, but but it's a, a very important question. I I think.
There's an yeah. interesting uh, comment that just caught, but got put into the chat um, about early career researchers and coming into sort of a system of science with an open mind and really wanting to share findings, but then learning through the culture around them that they should probably not be doing that. So I think that's a really interesting thing. And I'd love to hear, I think, Melissa, you might have some interesting insights on this as well. Like, when do we learn that open science is how we're supposed to do things? And when do we learn that maybe that's not in our best interest? And what's the interplay between this as we move throughout our careers? Yeah, I, I think I was going to frame this in another way, but uh still in the same subject which is the common knowledge and the common culture that we come into because we were talking about governance and i was thinking how we all repeat that we are doing consensus uh decision making and that the governance you know there's no leaders there's no um structure and then you know i'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the tyranny of structurelessness and all that um, current of thought that goes uh, explaining that if you don't have a specific structure set, then what takes over is the common sense and people tend to repeat the power structures that they have in society, in their lives, etc. And so what I see in terms of the common research culture and how that keeps propagating, even though people who come into research as early career researchers or as young programmers or as young contributors to open source projects, maybe they do have innovative ideas and they come with maybe different ways of doing things, but they fall into the common patterns that we're already seeing. And it's very hard to escape that when everyone around you is doing that. That's the culture uh, thing. And so I, I was reflecting on what Kate was talking about in terms of governance and uh, all the questions of openness and how do you uh, uh, manage that. And honestly, I'd love to hear what you all have to say because that is something that is not clear in my mind how we solve that and how, you know, how we can figure out ways around those set cultures that lead us in specific paths that maybe we want to do differently. So, uh, of course, I don't have an answer. I think there's an answer for that. But <laughs> I have some, some thoughts, perhaps. Uh, uh, I guess that uh, as an, I, I'm a, a super early career researcher, right? I, I'm a, a PhD student. So uh, this common research culture is, is, is all around me. And but I'm, I'm under the impression that we, we often have this. Uh, we see that there's this track of the closed uh, classical structured way of thinking. But I often see that people that diverge from this path, they don't they don't get burned that much. And I think there's an illusion that that uh, that things have to be in a way. And if you don't comply with the way things are, uh, you get problems. But what I see is that often maybe there's a, other biases, but I often see the people that that uh, steer away from this highway. They they, they find ways in, in to to thrive in different in different forms. I mean, uh, uh, so what I'm trying to say, perhaps, is, is uh, I guess one of the ways is is to make people feel comfortable that there are ways to survive if you don't follow the, the common research culture. So if you feel that that doing things in a more open way will be better for you, for society, but you are afraid that this might hurt your career, perhaps that's not the case. Maybe I'll just tell a story. There is one researcher here in, in, in the University of Rio, uh, Olavo Amaral. He is having the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative. And he mentioned that five years ago, he just decided not to do any bench work anymore and work in, in open ways. And he took this this leap, and then he, he his career actually went much better. He got grants, and he got ways of participating by kind of turning away from the common uh, research culture and going to the the open path. So I think there are ways to thrive in the in the in the open open ways, let's say. And I think that, but it's not easy to see. I guess that there is kind of this this. It's not easy to see that you can survive outside the common mainstream research culture. I guess that, that's kind of, yeah.
I think that's that's a very that that's a very important point um, in the sense that we you know we talked about making we talked about how it's difficult for various groups of people because of various reasons to you know participate in open science um, but perhaps this point touches on something which is you know a, a sense of for the one of a better word please help me out here freedom so a, an ability to sort of decide that this is the space that I will be comfortable in, even if I feel like I would be the odd one out or I'm not conforming, right? So I'd be very critical here to say that, you know, open science has a culture, right? So um, it may not be the same in every single community and it, it's definitely not the same uh, across geographies that we, 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 um, we're from, but there's definitely, you know, there, there is a sort of, that there is a certain culture around open science communities and how they're supposed to be done um, that is also very excluding to some groups of people. Um, and so I, I wonder, you know, if, if, if we're sort of stepping on our own toes here and, and, and not doing the thing that we actually want to do, which is perhaps what Tiago said, just to, for people to feel like they can have their own paths and, and shape the way that they want to do science and research or just be in, in the way that they feel most comfortable. Um. I really love that, uh, Emmy, I think you were putting those thoughts together right as I was articulating a question in the comments about or in the chat about the idea that, you know, and I experienced this in my own academic position, um, the people who I worked with um, sort of most immediately, most closely, and those were collaborators at my own institution, other researchers I met at um, other institutions, um, they were often, uh, they did not hold similar value structures always with the way that I wanted to do research and the sort of degree of openness with which I was comfortable. Um, but it's also true that the communities that I interacted with that I chose to belong to were the ones that helped normalize the activities with which I engaged. And so I'm really interested in this idea of like, how can our chosen communities, the ones that we opt into, um, how they can help drive the cultural change that we want to see um, by making us less isolated. It's also an interesting comparison of then we have sort of value conflicts between um, some of the people in our research communities and then the ones that we are choosing to engage with that have similarly aligned values and how do we balance those different forces together. That's a difficult one. <laughs> I think everyone is sort of thinking. Does anyone want to hop on and uh, have a reflect on that, perhaps? Yeah, I don't know if it's fair for me to jump in because I actually left academia, so I didn't stick around to see what was going on. But I can say that from experience, that's exactly what happened to me in terms of feeling less isolated and feeling empowered, actually to go forward with this because I found a community that was developing, that was you know, working together and working in the open. And I kind of understood how this could benefit me and others. Um, but I feel like that's that empowerment that comes from a, a community and a, a nice culture, let's say, around a certain community of practice or a group or um, organization is not easy to build and so i feel like this is kind of what a lot of communities are thriving and and looking for um creating that that sense of group and community and empowering other people to become uh participants and and feel um safe and and you know bringing contributions to the table but that's not easy to do, especially if you don't have support from the infrastructure. And by that, I mean the government, the university, or the, you know, the grant board or uh, funding opportunities and all of that. So I, I, I'm curious to know 
how this is done in other countries. After all, I'm in Brazil and I know that it's not easy to get those things here, like institutional support for openness. Uh, well, yeah, uh, usually when when we have this, this uh, discussions around these topics or the uh, award that usually comes up, it's incentives and, um, and uh, in, in our specific uh, country or a specific context uh, or in the com academic communities that I uh, share time with, uh, there, are, there are not many incentives for openness uh, openness is not rewarded, so um, so any initiatives uh, um, trying to promote openness uh, are are in need. Even though there are umbrellas uh, beyond us, for example, for example, in in research output, we have le policy, we have legislation in Argentina, which uh, which, is, which is when our research is funded by public funds. Uh, the outcomes of this research should be available to the public, and and and, and so we have a lot of repositories and also primary dat data, and and we are we are trying to, to 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 convince our colleagues about the importance of this aspect beyond the law and beyond enforcement and beyond mandates. It, 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 so so I think we have a lot uh, of lack of awareness of the of 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 of. of of why this, the promotion of openness is important in terms of advance, advancements for the community itself. Uh, it, it's a discussion that we are having uh, in, in our closest circles, which has a lot of with, uh, with how we redefine research assessment. And so, so, so uh, if we do not consider that, that aspect during research assessment, for evaluation and promotion, there is there is it's very difficult to be implemented in our with our colleagues. So it's something that we have been discussing a lot. It's not easy to implement, but I, I, I I'm 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 finding that 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 ever and ever we, there there is a lot of more um, um, awareness of of the importance in openness. For instance, in the context of the pandemic, where where the general population beyond academy has uh, realized. Uh, well, as a shock about the importance of access and and and, and openness in research, uh, in the research process and also in research outputs. So uh, uh, that's an interesting point, like the, the motivations and 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 of the community. One thing that think about what Kate, Melissa, and Umberto said. One thing that I sometimes feel that is that. Sometimes the communities, the governments, or, or the funding agents, they have values about how things should be done and how science should spread and, and, and the, this, this general values. But these values, they don't often become clear in the all levels of the research chain. So perhaps when companies usually have missions and values and visions, but I don't think that research laboratories have that that in such a clear way i mean you have this mission you have these values you have these principles and and perhaps it, for me it's not so much a, a, about awareness but, but about yeah okay so we have this common agreement that research should benefit humanity and but we sometimes stray away from that and i think it, perhaps with uh of course not solution but perhaps if we have more clear values from the community like explicit values for the communities that we are in we could make sure that our practices match our values right I mean, if if the university states clearly that our projects products should be uh, accessible and available and, and if this is a it's a value that's shared and explicit then if you're not following that it, it becomes clear so and perhaps that's something that, that we can uh, adjust for small communities one thing that is relatively new, but it's it's becoming more and more common to have code of conducts. So you have a community, you have a project, you, we have an event and you have a code of conduct, which is often just obvious things, but it's it's always good to have these obvious things written so you can say, hey, you are doing something that you're not supposed to, this is written here. So maybe if you have like a, a, a code of conduct in a, in, in a way of how we see our products of knowledge, of code, of research, whatever, 
when people are steering away from that, you could say, hey, you are you are not following this obvious thing that everyone agreed to like uh, ever. So so maybe we could think about ways of like making values more clear and more obvious so people don't fall on the mistakes to, to avoid the value. Uh, Tiago, I appreciate your reference to codes of conduct and how they can start to normalize expectations or make make our uh, sort of commonly understood what we think are commonly understood expectations explicit um, and sort of in a way more formalizing um, what it is like guidelines are for interacting with other people. And it does remind me, though, that um, having policies like that sort of set out don't mean a lot unless you have a way to enforce it. I think there is something really important to be said for having that written down and pointed somewhere, right? Like being able to send people to it is important. Um, but I've seen like even more harm that's been done by a code of conduct where people say, yes, this is what we expect. And yet, when push comes to shove, you know, it's it's not enforced um, and that that can cause harm as well. Um, and I think so. I think this also relates back um, to a question that had been posted in chat about funder policies on open access and open research. Um, it's the same sort of thing. Like there are a lot of policies out there. Um, and making sure that those policies, which honestly, in a lot of cases, most policies have exceptions allowed. Um, and again, like that is, we require you to share your data unless it's going to violate some individual's privacy, right? And that's a very simple example. But the truth is that every research data set has some special, unique little thing about it. Um, and so, I think making sure that the enforcement of open access, open research, um, openly sharing information about our data, making sure that that is made sort of as um, equally enforced as possible and finding ways to do that that are less accusatory and more about edging people towards a place of more openness. And by that, I mean, like, it's easy to throw up, you know, a tabular data set into a repository and say, yes, I published my data, but if there's no metadata about it, then no one can use it. Is that actually meeting the requirement? Um, and again, like sorting out those nuances takes a huge amount of effort. I've been thinking a lot about these since I started working for a funder and figuring out how can I authentically, as a research scientist, help other research scientists do better. Um, and I honestly, I personally care far less about enforcement than about, again, incrementally improving openness and recognizing that most scientists right now are coming into requirements for openness that are building on a legacy of, in some cases, decades worth of a lack of openness in where the data they're working with have already come from. And reconciling that is not as simple as like submitting a data set to a repository. Um, so again, like, I think that requirements help and figuring out like how can funders continue to support um, and that includes both like sort of gently nudging people towards being like, you really need to do this and also providing the means with which to do that, which is something I think Umberto mentioned earlier. Um, all of those things are required um, to be able to get there. And I wanna tie it back to communities and continue to say that like, if you have a group of people who are saying, my funder is requiring me to do this, then that nudges other groups, that nudges journal publishers who have less than optimal open access policies to push it to do better. Yeah, definitely. I find that like in, in, in my role in the institution, right, where we, we see funders and, and um, national agencies making new policies about open science, that actually is a path for participation for a lot of people, especially in uh, those in administration roles, for example, you know, contract managers and uh, grant uh, people who support researchers um, uh, with, with their grant proposals, like open science was not on their radar and they could not participate in this discussion before. And because it's now on, you know, it's now important and they have to address this, they were sort of, for the again, for the one of a better phrase, forced to learn about this. But, you know, that's also a path into um learning about this right and 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 um 
And uh, yeah, it's it's th that needs to be sort of refined and built person for everyone, but as in for everyone individually. But um, but it is, you know, we talked about different stakeholders and we talk about different community cultures and and I think you know these these do serve different places but for different communities to to widen that participation in that conversation. Um, catching up on the chat, but if anyone wants to jump in at this point. <laughs> oh, we will just comment then, and there, there's a question, a comment from Patricia talking about projects, uh, medical projects and devices that are not shared. So uh, it's that's a, that's a very interesting point. I mean, uh, I think knowledge is a human right, but if we take like the real world and, and we see that companies they won't they won't open all the their their research process right so there's some trade up there's a uh, there's a field of open drug discovery uh, which uh, entails the idea that in the beginning of the research process you can share as much of the the knowledge that you have so other companies themselves can benefit so there's a lot of money wasted in these companies because they are doing this this r and d uh, doing the same things and failing at the same things so everyone is losing and if make the maybe the, the competition could be at a higher level in the, the chain right things could be open at the beginning and then companies could make money some other way but that's that's a hard question because ideally i want everything to be open but at the same time you cannot do this when you have funding pressures and and, and, and investors and so so it's 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 hard to make. For me, a theoretical solution is quite clear. Everything should be open, but then you have to co contrast that with the, how the world actually works. So, um, We at CZI and the Open Science team have worked a little bit in the open hardware space. Um, and we had some discussion about open hardware at one of our um, recent annual meetings. And the take home lesson is that like, yes, it is. There are the same sorts of levers and incentives that you can support in open hardware as you can for other things. But the the tie in of like the capitalism associated with that type of product is even more difficult to overcome than in other cases. Um, again, that's something I'm still learning about. And I think it's keenly interesting. And I sort of keep my eye on all the things coming out and, and figuring out too, like, how do you split the difference between open space um, and making things open for academic use and then licensing associated with commercial use? Okay, but again, in the medical realm, that's even harder, especially when we're thinking about things here in the United States. I want to apologize on behalf of my country for um, our healthcare system. Um, yeah, it's, it's incredibly difficult to balance all, um, all of these things. Um, it sort of touches on what you said earlier, Kate, about sort of, okay, you know, we want the same of some things, and but we don't, we want the opposite of other things. How can we participate in the same conversation to move things forward in a, in, in a mutually agreeable agenda, let's put it this way. Um, but, I, but I also am wondering, you know, talking about open hardware, um, and and um, sort of building scaffolds or architectures for for people to be able to um, innovate, but also reuse and and participate in open conversations and and, and publish data, etc. Um, what are some of the what are some of the sort of resources or or shared um, uh, assets, shared resources and support? But that's a better word <laughs> uh, that we see in our communities that that our communities can have access to and maybe some other communities can too. Malvika says shared resources in open spaces. Alyssa, are you going to go ahead? Melissa, we can't hear you. Um, 
while Melissa is uh, sorting out her audio from no problem take your time um anyone else want to hop in and talk about how we can share maybe some some of the support and resources that we have let me try it oh we got you for a second <laughs> maybe not i'm gonna no I think you're okay. Sorry, I'm into. That's all right. Um, yeah, I guess I, I fundamentally one one thing that we we serious we we should really keep in mind when we're pursuing um, you know conversations about openness and accessibility is you know technology access to technology that you would allow you to access those spaces, right? So, um, I, I this is this is like not answering my own question. <laughs> But um, but I, I really admire um, uh, efforts that has been put in by by already some organization on sort of making sure that like this type of spaces where we have these type of discussions um, are accessible for folks who maybe you know need that extra internet or um, need to buy some time or need to yeah just just you know things that make it a little bit easier and continue to iterate over that as well to make sure that it continues to work for the, for, for folks around uh, the world and, and from different backgrounds. Um, yeah, uh, just jumping in, uh, that's yeah. an interesting point because when you have virtual events, often we think that because they are virtual, they are accessible to everyone in the world. Uh, one thing that, that, that I noticed is that almost always the microphones and cameras of people in the global north are better from the ones in the global south, I mean that, that, that that's a, that's not by coincidence. It's just that things are very are way more expensive for us in, in Brazil to buy a good microphone and a good camera and, and so on. And these things kind of mount, right? And I remember at the live sprint, there were some people from Nigeria, and we had a lot of trouble to to work with some of them because of internet connection and and these other things. So this is something that. The support and, and and one thing is that you can for example have a grant and have support for an event but that doesn't really solve I mean, you, you kind of need kind of more long-term solutions or long-term processes and i mean in some places digital inclusion and internet are promoted at least in brazil that happens that big companies big social media companies uh kind of promote this this inclusion, but not in a way that that benefits so other communities. So there are people that have internet access in Brazil, but only can access a few social media profiles, but not as in Zoom. So I guess the, the discussion about open openness has to discuss a bit about this access to internet, which is something that, or, or at least think about that. Like think that not everyone that wants to be here can be here because of technical reasons and, and, and other stuff, yeah. Okay, go ahead. There's an interesting um, sort of conversation about codes of conduct that I've sort of sidetracked myself into in the chat. And so I want to uh, thank Wolfgang and Sarah for your contributions to that conversation and talking about like, a code of conduct represents something. It represents sort of what the, the values are of an organization or group and what it is that we expect people to do. And then thinking about, um, you know, my comments about enforcement and how enforcement matters. Um, but the idea um, that Sarah and Wolfgang have highlighted is that, you know, thinking about instead of enforcement enacting what it is um, that the values represented in the code of conduct mean in practice, like among the shared community is really important as well. And it occurs to me that like that I think is really in line with what we think about in open communities. Um, it's kind of like flipping the idea of here are the rules. If you violate the rules, then we are going to enforce, you know, which is like some superhero comic book figure of coming in with like, you know, I don't know, a lasso to get people in. And uh, I think what instead we're thinking about in the chat, and I think Wolfgang put it far more eloquently than I did about um, 
using what Sarah calls, you know, sort of like a, a, a value of empathy and kindness associated with it ahead of time. Um, and it's kind of like, what I think of is, is like, don't wait to think about how you deal with code of conduct stuff until after something happens. I think that's the main point that all of us are saying. And it's like, then I tend to think of it as enforcement. Like if somebody does something that violates your code of conduct, you can't just wait till later to think about, well, what happens now? Um, thinking about it ahead of time as a way of cultivating that culture is, is a really useful model. And again, as I think we all keep coming back to this idea of changing culture or supporting culture or cultivating culture, um, then, you know, that's uh, far more useful and interesting than the idea of like policing what it is people are doing. Thanks, Kate. Um, we can continue. I just want to intermittently break here to say, uh, if it's okay, we're going to stop the recording because we passed the hour. So, um, um, it doesn't really change anything else other than that um, you are not, you will not be recorded anymore. So I suppose we could open the floor up to, um, you know, more questions from from the audience, and also just, yeah, if that makes a difference, you know, unrecorded discussions. <laughs> For the recording sake, thank you so much, Emmy, for chairing and all of the speakers. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, as you know, the next half an hour is allocated for us to have open discussions with you. That part is not being recorded and it would be lovely to see your face. So with that, I'm gonna stop the recording.